The Chinese Communist Party is celebrating the departure of Donald Trump as U.S. president. Beijing authorities impose sanctions on 28 Trump administration officials. U.S. President Biden's nominee for Secretary of State proposes a new approach to countering Chinese influence. We look into the differences between the new approach and his predecessors. Founder Jack Ma of Chinese e-commerce giant Alibaba has resurfaced. It's the Mughal's first appearance since October, after he offended the communist regime. And 10 years ago, China's former dictator Mao Zedong's grandson wished the CCP a long life of 100 years. This year, his comment is going viral as the party marks its 100th anniversary. Welcome to China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. As President Trump leaves office, some authorities on the other side of the Pacific are celebrating. The Chinese regime state media is saying good riddance Donald Trump. The tweet included a link to an article saying good riddance Trump administration and its final madness. The article slammed Trump's foreign policy, especially his punishing China over trade abuses, his sanctions against Chinese officials over human rights abuses, and his support for Taiwan. It added China and the U.S. are now in a good position to help each other, saying, quote, U.S. policymakers in the future should not let this relationship be led astray by a small bunch of extreme forces. Congressman Jim Banks responded on Twitter, writing, It's never a good sign when our greatest adversary is posting celebratory memes. The Chinese regime imposes new sanctions on Trump administration officials. That includes former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, an outspoken critic of the regime's human rights violations. The Chinese Communist Party's Ministry of Foreign Affairs will impose sanctions on former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo and other Trump administration officials. The retaliatory move comes one day after Pompeo declared the CCP's repression of Uyghur Muslims in the Xinjiang region a genocide. Biden's pick for Secretary of State Anthony Blinken told a Senate hearing on Tuesday that he agreed with the designation. The CCP's repression of Uyghurs has drawn international condemnation. It's perpetrated through a network of internment camps and a massive surveillance system. A CCP ministry spokesperson defended the sanctions against Pompeo and 27 others by claiming that they undertook, quote, crazy actions, damaged U.S.-China relations, and hurt the feelings of the Chinese people. The American officials named and their immediate family members will be banned from entering mainland China, Hong Kong, and Macau. The sanction also restricts companies affiliated with them from doing business with China. Just hours before the Trump administration stepped down, China's foreign ministry took aim at its chief U.S. counterpart. The ministry said it would seek cooperation with the incoming Biden administration and called Secretary of State Mike Pompeo a liar and a cheater. Pompeo unleashed a barrage of measures against China in his final weeks in office. He delivered his own parting shot on Tuesday. That's when he announced the Trump administration determined China committed genocide and crimes against humanity by repressing the Uyghur Muslim minority in its western Xinjiang region. China's foreign ministry spokeswoman Hua Chengying said, quote, Pompeo's so-called determination is nothing but a waste of paper. China has repeatedly rejected accusations of abuse of its ethnic population in Xinjiang. A United Nations panel has said at least one million Uyghurs and other Muslims have been detained in camps. Hua also called Pompeo a doomsday clown adding that she hoped the Biden administration would work to, quote, push Sino-U.S. relations back on track to healthy and stable development as soon as possible. President Biden's nominee for Secretary of State is proposing a new approach to countering the influence of the CCP. We spoke with an expert to see his perspective on this new approach. Our reporter Juliet Song has the story. At the confirmation hearing on Tuesday, President Biden's pick for Secretary of State said he agrees with Trump's approach to China in some aspects. I also believe that um, uh, President Trump was right in taking uh, a tougher approach to China. Uh, I disagree very much with uh, the way that he went about it in a number of areas, but the basic principle was the right one, and I think that's actually helpful uh, to our foreign policy. Blinken says there is no doubt China poses the most significant challenge of any nation state to the U.S. There are, as I see it, rising adversarial aspects to the relationship, certainly competitive ones, and still some cooperative ones when it is in uh, our mutual interest. 
He adds that the U.S. needs to deal with the communist regime by working with allies, what he calls a position of strength. Position of strength when we are working with, not denigrating, uh, our allies. That's a source of strength for us in dealing with China. A U.S.-based China commentator says the biggest difference between the two administrations China approaches is their foundation. The Trump administration approaches the Chinese regime from an ideological perspective. That's why we see when Pompeo told the European countries it's not a choice between the U.S. and China, but a choice between freedom and tyranny. Tang says Blinken's China approach aims to form an interest-based alliance to counter Beijing. And an alliance based on interests would bring a problem. Even though it looks powerful by numbers, it's also loose and easy to break apart. And we're already seeing alarming signs now. Multiple U.S. allies signed economic deals with China in recent months. This includes countries in both Europe and the Asia-Pacific region. So if you want to corner the Chinese Communist Party with an interest-based alliance, the CCP can also easily split up and corrupt your allies with economic interests. Signing these trade deals suggests these countries won't suggest cooperation with the communist regime on some important economic areas. Tang us that as long as the Chinese regime can get its hands on Western capital and technology, it can use it to grow its power to a point beyond control. And then it can overtake the United States as the most powerful country in the world. Once it reaches that level, no country in this world will be able to rein in the CCP. It could really dominate the world. He says the Chinese regime's conflict with the international society is rooted in its communist ideology, and that crippling the regime's economic power would be one of the most effective ways to counter its influence. Juliet Song, NTD News. President Trump worked closely with the Treasury Department to counter threats from China. But how will the department look like under President Biden? NTD's Penny Zhou has more on the big China decision awaiting Biden's nominee for Treasury Secretary. Another important cabinet member that has a big say in how America's China policy goes is the Treasury Secretary. President Biden's nominee for that post is Janet Yellen. The former Federal Reserve chair will have to make some big decisions, including what to do with President Trump's tariffs and sanctions against communist China, and how to deal with national security risks posed by Chinese tech companies. Well, China is clearly uh, our most important strategic competitor. As you said, we need to work with allies We also need to strengthen our own economy so that we can compete. We need to take on uh, China's abusive, unfair, and illegal practices. We're prepared to use the full array of tools to address. Of course, it is important over time to work with our allies. By framing China as a strategic competitor, Yellen echoes other Biden cabinet members. And her emphasis on working with allies is in line with her previous criticism against what's often called the unilateral approach President Trump adopted when countering China. It mainly refers to the trade war. President Trump slapped tariffs on hundreds of billions worth of Chinese imports, thus to punish the regime's abusive trade behaviors. Yellen has been a vocal critic of Trump's trade war against China, but neither she nor President Biden has said whether they will remove the tariffs. They have also been vague about exactly how they will counter threats from communist China if they were to replace Trump's policies. President Trump relied heavily on the Treasury Department's sanction to punish CCP officials involved in human rights abuses. It remains to be seen whether Yellen would keep these approaches. If confirmed as Treasury Secretary, Yellen would also need to decide what to do with Chinese tech companies. President Trump considered banning TikTok and other Chinese apps, citing American data safety as a concern. All Chinese companies are required by law to share intelligence with the CCP when necessary. Yellen has previously warned of the risks of technological decoupling between the U.S. and China, saying, quote, the rivalry could hinder technological progress since it will stop countries' abilities to learn from each other. In addition, Yellen will oversee CFIUS, that's an agency within the department that assesses whether a certain foreign investment poses a threat to U.S. national security. Our colleagues believe that China has found gaps in both the existing CFIUS process and export control regime and is exploiting each of them to the detriment of U.S. national security. In the past few years, the agency has stepped up its scrutiny of Chinese investment. 
It has banned a suspicious Chinese company from acquiring U.S. firms possessing large amounts of sensitive user data. It remains to be seen whether the new secretary will keep the pressure on the CCP or change course. Penny Zhou, NTD News. A Trump administration intelligence official is warning the Biden administration about Communist China's malign foreign influence. In an interview with Fox News, Bill Ivana says that, quote, no country poses a broader, more severe intelligence collection threat to America than China. He says China has worked hard to exploit and amplify discourse in the U.S. in the aftermath of George Floyd's death, the CCP virus pandemic, and the election. Ivana also says the regime targets both local and federal level politicians. The tactics include, quote, bribery, blackmail and covert dealings with businesses. And what is the goal? To influence American policy so that they align with the CCP's global interests. Ivana emphasizes the importance of data safety in countering China's malign operations. Havana warns that the Chinese regime's operations in the U.S. is not just a government problem, but a society problem. Alibaba Group founder Jack Ma has resurfaced. He joined a virtual meeting with 100 Chinese teachers on Wednesday morning. It's his first appearance since October. Here's the details. So, I just don't see... After months of speculation about his whereabouts, China's richest man, Jack Ma, has resurfaced in a short online video praising China's teachers. It's the first time the founder of Alibaba has been seen in public since October, when he blasted China's regulatory system during a speech at a Shanghai forum. Those comments set him on a collision course with Beijing officials and led to the abrupt suspension of the IPO of Ant Group, the payments firm he controls. The blockbuster listing had been set to be the largest ever before it was abruptly pulled in November. Weeks later, Ma skipped the filming of a TV talent show he created for African entrepreneurs. His absence led to media reports and speculation that he was missing. Wednesday's reappearance by Ma has driven a sharp jump in Alibaba's shares. In the video, he praises 100 teachers and tells them we will meet again when the health crisis is over. According to local reports, the online event was the Jack Ma Rural Teachers Award Ceremony. His physical whereabouts were not disclosed. Ma's video came as Alibaba now faces an antitrust investigation by Chinese regulators. A woman becomes the subject of public verbal abuse. That's because one man caught her using an iPhone, despite the Chinese Communist Party's efforts to discourage Apple products. NTD's Don Ma has more on the story. Reports emerged from China's Shandong province of a man verbally abusing a woman just because she was using an iPhone. The man's actions stem from when the Chinese Communist Party incited the public to boycott Apple products and support Chinese telecom giant Huawei's mobile phones back in 2018. The boycott came after Huawei CFO Meng Wanzhou was arrested on U.S. fraud charges and after the U.S. put trade sanctions on Huawei. Following the CCP's push to discourage iPhone sales in China, some mainland Chinese companies began punishing employees who disregarded the call, while others were rewarded for buying Huawei devices. Ironically, despite Beijing officials' efforts to reject Apple, they themselves have been seen using the company's products. In 2019, Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesman Zhao Lijian took to Twitter to mock Apple. But curiously, netizens noticed he used an iPhone to do it. Huawei CFO Meng Wanzhou has even been seen using Apple products. At the time of her arrest, she was carrying a variety of Apple devices, including an iPhone 7 Plus, a MacBook Air, and iPad Pro. Huawei's official Twitter account has also been caught in the act. On New Year's Eve 2018, Huawei posted a tweet wishing people a happy new year. But the post was later found to have been posted by an iPhone. Soon after, the message was taken down. 
Reporting by Don Ma, NTD News. Since the CCP virus pandemic broke out a year ago, hand sanitizers have become everyday items in many households. But one brand of hand sanitizer from China was found to cause serious health risks to people. It is sold in the UK through online platforms such as eBay and Alibaba. According to UK media reports, the country's Consumer Protection Department is issuing an urgent recall for a hand sanitizer called IBCCCNDC, Instant Hand Sanitizer. The brand is made in China by a company called Guangzhou Shichu Network Technology. The product is found to contain 37 percent methanol. Methanol is a toxic alcohol commonly used in pesticides. It can enter the human body through the skin, damage the liver, cause blindness and even death. In the UK, methanol is banned as an ingredient in hand sanitizers. The product was also found to be ineffective for killing germs, including the CCP virus. This is because it contains only 7 percent of ethanol. Ethanol is the ingredient in hand sanitizers mainly responsible for killing germs. Other hand sanitizers of the same kind usually contain about 10 times more ethanol. Another hand gel that was recalled in the UK is called Yucky Hands. It is from a US-based producer called Yucky Group. This product is not poisonous, but because of its low level of ethanol, it may be insufficient in killing germs. Now we turn to a Chinese lab responsible for processing virus test results. It's since been found to have falsified some results. More than 300,000 residents in China's Xingtai City, part of Hebei province, were tested for the virus on January 12th and 13th. The next day, the Huaxi Medical Testing Lab delivered the test results. Not a single test came back positive. But by using other means, the city's health department discovered a number of positive test samples. The findings prompted them to retest 10 residents as part of an experiment. Three of them came back positive. The city announced that the lab reported faulty results on Sunday. Since then, the city has been put under lockdown. Chinese media reported that the lab can process 100,000 samples a day. Operating at that rate, it would have been impossible for the facility to deliver 300,000 individual test results within one day. According to a senior manager from the lab's parent company, the lab was still testing the samples at the time the results were delivered. The medical lab report had not yet been issued at the time. But the lab's management asked employees to expedite the process. So one employee finalized the results before finishing the testing. The lab's parent company has 54 subsidiaries and 33 labs across China. It's unknown if the company was involved in mass testing samples from other cities. Now we turn to the wealthiest man in Asia. Chinese businessman Zhong Sensen resigned as chairman of a drug maker for personal reasons last week. Zhong is the founder of Wantai Biofarm. Forbes says his net worth reaches about 90 billion U.S. dollars, making him the most affluent man in China. That's as of January 1st. Despite the resignation, he still holds over 70 percent of the company's shares, both directly and indirectly. The company says its CCP virus vaccine is still in phase two of clinical trials. The research and development phase has been slower than its competitors. As a result, the company's share price is facing about 10 percent fluctuations. Another Chinese drug maker is in a similar situation. The chairman and general manager of Sinopharm Group also resigned last week for personal reasons. The abrupt moves have sparked suspicion, especially as the safety and effectiveness of Chinese vaccines are facing questions from international experts. Now we look to Mao Zedong's grandson. Mao was one of the founders of the Chinese Communist Party and ruler of the dictatorship from the 50s to the 70s. His image still appears on Chinese banknotes, and his body has been kept in a memorial building in Tiananmen Square, an area that marks the center of Beijing. His only grandson, Mao Xingyu, recently caught the public's eye over something he did 10 years ago. Back in 2011, he wrote a statement wishing the Chinese Communist Party a, quote, long life of a hundred years. This year, July 1st, marks the 100th anniversary of the Communist Party. Its leaders are already actively preparing for a major celebration. But some netizens are making sarcastic comments online, pointing out that Mao's grandson predicted 10 years ago that the CCP would perish in 2021. 
it remains unclear what 2021 will hold for the Communist Party. But the viral comments suggest many Chinese people may be hopeful for the end of the Chinese regime. And that's all for today's China In Focus. But before you go, I want to thank you, our viewers, on behalf of the entire China In Focus team. We passed 600,000 subscribers earlier this month when I was in Washington, D.C., covering the events of January 6th. It's been less than a year since this channel was launched, and we couldn't have achieved this without your support. Thank you again, and see you tomorrow. Hi, we're happy to announce that you can also catch us on cable TV now. Millions of households already choose us as one of their trusted news sources, and you can too. You can watch us in Chicago, Washington, D.C., New York, and many other cities as well. And if your system doesn't carry NTD yet, you can just give them a quick call and request NTD on your cable provider. Thank you for watching. See you next time.